Stand back up. I know, this is the exercise class. So far you've already burnt 300 calories, you're getting ready to 300 more. Ready? 300 more. There we go, we're going to sing that chorus again. Sing that chorus again.
Some blind people, he just said, he just, you're healed. Other people, he put love in their eye. You know, so, so, <laughs> so again, you never know how God's going to do it. You just got to trust that he's going to do it. Amen? Amen? Now, get your Bible out. Now, remember, this is, this, like, the last two weeks was the actual introduction. <laughs> believe it or not. I know some of y'all are going, yeah, believe me, yeah, i introduction. So, so it's part 1A and part 1B. Now, now we're going to go into part 2. And, and this is very valid for this day, for this time. God is working in our midst, but if we're not careful, we get into the uh, thinking everything's hunky-dory, everything's going to be shining bright, we're not going to have any problems. You serve God, everything's right, everything's going to be good. And honestly, that's not it. Because you're going to have struggles. This is what it's about. Get stand for the reading of the word. Turn to Numbers 13. Numbers 13. This is just our key uh, text. And I'm going to be getting stuff from this text again. But it's not the same sermons you've had for the last two weeks. So don't sit back and say he's going to do the same thing over again. No, but there, there was one preacher that when he went to the church, he preached a sermon. Everybody says, this is an awesome sermon, Pastor. The next week he preached it again. They said, uh, Maybe he didn't realize he had preached it. On the third week, he preached it again. <laughs> on the fourth week, he preached the same sermon. So one of the guys went and said, Pastor, you know, it's an awesome sermon, but four times? Don't you have any other sermons? I know you do. He says, yeah, but when you start living this one, I'll go to the next one. <laughs> okay, y'all, that was not up from the old joke book. All right. Ready? Number 13. <clears throat> Verse 26. And then when it came to Moses and to Aaron and to the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land or actually the proof of the promise. Y'all say proof of the promise. That's why it is the proof of the promise. And they told him and said, We came unto the land where thou sentest us and surely it flows with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. Y'all say proof of the promise again. <laughs> nevertheless, even though we see the proof of the promise, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great, and moreover the dog. Get it? Moreover the dog? Okay, never mind. Well, I'm just saying if y'all are listening. Moreover, we saw the children of Andy there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites. And the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is the land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. <coughs> And all the people we saw in it <coughs> are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, <coughs> which came, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight. Y'all say own sight. <laughs> it's very important how you see yourself. In our own sight as grasshoppers. So we were in their sight. So it's for your hands this way. Father, we love you, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We know, God, that you're alive and well on the throne, Father. We know, God, that you're working miracles in our midst. I ask you right now, Lord, to touch and to anoint, to have your will and your way in our lives. God, you know what we need, and you know, God, that we need you now. I ask you right now, Lord, to touch us all. Help us, Lord, to know that there's battles coming, but we can't overcome. In the name of Jesus, we love you. And we praise your name. And church said, Amen. On the way down, tell somebody to pass this behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is with us. And nothing, and nothing, and nothing shall be impossible. Praise God. I don't know why it's blooming, but something is blooming. Praise God. And I'll be glad when it gets already bloomed out. Amen. Is there artificial flowers? No, I've it's been doing it everywhere, not just here. Artificial flowers are bad, but not as bad as it is in Washington. All right. Reporters. We're interviewing a 104-year-old woman. And they said, what's the best thing about being 104? She simply said, no peer pressure. 
<laughs> they're all gone. <laughs> Amen. They're all gone. Okay. We're going to talk about more than just peer pressure today. Again, we're going to talk about no pain, no gain, and we're going to talk about dealing with life struggles. But we're going to take it a little further than we have for the last two weeks. First, I'm going to give a few, a few, few from last week, and then we're going to jump right into this week. Just so the people that weren't here will know where we're coming from. Amen? Uh, there's a struggle principle. When we choose to walk by faith, we're met with resistance. And resistance equals struggle. Without struggle, our faith is hindered. We don't want to experience struggle, but we can't have faith without it. Listen carefully. Who wants struggle? I don't. But you can't have effective faith without struggle. And, and watch this now. Whenever God gives us a promise, He also gives us a problem. And those problems produce struggles. Well, listen. Faith causes us to grasp the promise, and the problems cause the promise to grasp back. Amen? So here it is. This is the last one last week. We're going into something new. This is what we've been talking about for the last two weeks. Ready? How many have been in struggles lately? I'm glad you have because you're going to hear something. If you're having a struggle today, number one, it's a sign that life is still in you. That's your potential. Number two, it's proof that Satan does not have you yet. You're a problem to him. Number three, God still has need of you. He has a purpose in your life. Number four, God is defending you. That's power coming your way. Number five, breakthrough is on the way. That's the promise. Psalm 34, 19 says, Many are the affliction of the righteous. Many, many are the challenges. Many are the struggles. Many are the problems. Many are the times that your faith has tried to the absolute end. Many times you feel like you've been given up, but God steps in and delivers them out of every one of them. That's his promise. So now, here's, our, here's where we're starting today. Eventually. Come on, there you go. When you like, <laughs> look at that. Damn, that, 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 the sons of Enoch, look how, look how big they are compared to the normal man. God left giants in the promised land on purpose. God left struggles in your life on purpose. And these struggles in our life are these giants in our life to produce struggle. How many faces some giants? Every time I go online with Lee, I'm facing a giant. Every time I go, I'm going to the hospital today, when I go to the hospital, when I go to those rooms, somebody's facing a giant. When you go to a nursing home, somebody's facing a giant. All of us have giants in our life. And you say, well, why didn't God take them out of our life? It's because he put them there to produce struggle. Nobody that I know of has a struggle-free life. You know of anybody? The only ones I know that have a struggle-free life, there's a little community right behind the church. That's the only guys I know that doesn't have struggle. God knows that a lack of struggle in our lives, watch this. When you don't have struggle in your life, it produces spiritual weakness. I, I, I remember in my life when, when it seems like <coughs> when I'm not going through struggle, I find myself getting spiritually weak. God becomes a cosmic sugar daddy, and I'm always telling God what I want. And I, I mean, as I get out of Sears catalog, I'm trying to figure out what I want God to do for me. I become spiritually weak. And also, I've lost that spiritual edge. We need to keep the edge. If we don't have the edge, we can't be sharp when the enemy comes our way. So remember, when you get vaccinated for the flu, what do they do? They put a weaker strain of flu in you so your body can build up the resistance. They can fight it. So then when the real stuff comes, you already got it taken care of. When the real stuff comes, you got this. The same way. God knows. He lets you struggle. He lets you get knocked down just so you won't be spiritually weak. You will keep
keep your spiritual edge or your scared spiritual edge. When I find myself with a lack of struggle, I become thankless to God. I expect everything just to fall into place. Instead of thanking God for taking care of me, all of a sudden now I begin to feel like I'm entitled. Also, without that spiritual struggle, we just get spiritually lazy. Just as lazy. I know I don't know, I'm the only one. I was thinking about my own life. I wrote this stuff. This is what happens to me when I find myself struggle free. But when struggles go into my life, when I'm facing the giants, and most of the time I face them every day, when I'm facing the giants, either for me or for somebody else, it keeps me sharp, on the edge, thankful to God, and no longer am I spiritual lazy. So, so, so this holds you to say something. I want to think about it. If you have found yourself in any one of these categories, or all four of them, and you're asking God to help you, struggle is on the way. And don't blame the devil for the giants in your life. I'll let us sink in. Don't blame the devil. Instead of blaming the devil, thank God. Because he loves you too much to leave you like you are. And he knows things are coming your way that can be crushing if you haven't had that inoculation. If you had not had that little bit of virus stuck in your body so your body, your, your, your antibodies can fight it. So, 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 watch this now. So, here, why, why, here, here we're talking about what I got left in there. Number one, and I got a little story I want to read to you while, while we're at this. Come on. God left giants in the promised land to produce struggle is because he knew his people needed to learn how to fight. I love to skip into church and skip out of church and get in my car and drive like I'm at Mayberry. And the worst thing we got to worry about is Otis coming into jail cell. That is not reality. I don't remember how many times Andy Griffin was married between three and seven times. I can't remember. It's a lot. Three. How many? Three. Three, okay. Right, three times. And he said, I heard him say that his life on the outside of the show was tore apart. He said it was just in shambles. He said he'd come back to the show and the show would bring him some, would bring him some, some, some ease because he would love to think his life could be that easy. But his life was not that easy. He was always in a struggle. So, the same way, it's not Mayberry. It's real. The struggles are out there. And we need to learn how to fight. We're at war. How many know we're at war? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Jeff sent me an article, and this article was, was written about this pastor named Andrew Brunson. Anybody ever heard of Andrew Brunson? Andrew Brunson actually was a pastor in Turkey. This has just happened recently. He's a pastor in Turkey. He was recently detained for two years. <laughs> years. They said that he was helping and they were saying that he was part of a terrorist group. Wow. A Christian pastor telling about the word of God and he's part of a terrorist group. They finally negotiated and got him out after two years. He came to the United States. Tom Tillis is one of the guys that went, <coughs> went to see him while he was going through all this. And, and, and it brought him to the Congress, and he actually was doing the, the blessing at Congress. And when he stood up, he said, the church, the United States, is not prepared for persecution. What would you say today 
if they come in and said, all right, all y'all Christians stand up. And the people that told you that were wearing black masks and had guns in their hands. What would you do? Supposedly, <clears throat> supposedly, there was a church in New York, a big church. It was packed out. And these guys came in wearing black, had their faces covered. They had machine guns. And they said, everybody who is willing to, to die for their faith, if we are the Christians, will you stand up? The rest of you can leave. And said, that church started emptying out. So there was a few people standing and said, even up in the even up in the, behind the pulpit, there was a bunch of pastors. Pastors and song leaders started leaving. Just a handful of pastors and a handful of people. When all the people ran out, the guy looked up at the pastor and said, okay, pastor, all the hypocrites are gone. Go back with your service. We need to learn how to fight. This is not just get by. This is not Mayberry. This is war. And the enemy knows this is war. For the weapons of war are not carnal, but they're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Why? You see, they needed to learn how to fight. You know, think about this. I want you to think about something. Listen carefully. Listen very carefully. Remember, we're at war. Somebody say, we're at war. We're at war. And we wrestle not with each other. We wrestle with higher powers. Amen? And the war is a daily war. The attacks can come at any hour. It's a powerful war because all of your strength and all of your wisdom is not enough. <clears throat> it is all-inclusive. Because I don't know of anybody, not one person, that is exempt from this war that's happening around us. Especially this Turkish pastor. All he was doing was preaching the word of God and gets detained because he's a terrorist. If you look around, when they start talking about people's rights and what people are doing, they're all into all these other rights for all these other groups. When it comes to the Christians, they push us aside. When I took this at, at uh, this, this SHARP program and was helping with the SHARP program, they said, are you able to minister to everybody? I said, I'm able to minister to everybody. It doesn't matter. That's what we do. We're chaplains. I said, but when the bottom line comes, I'm going to talk about the blood. And they said, it's fine. And it was amazing to me. I got pulled aside one day, and I didn't even know the guy. He'd been in there, been in all the classes, been in there praying with us, got me to pray for him, talking about things. He told me, he said, here's what he told me. He said, uh, you know I'm a Muslim, don't you? I said, no, this is the first time I heard that. He said, I'll let you know. I said, well, that's cool. He said, I normally don't like Christian ministers. He said, but I like you. I said, well, that's cool, too. I like you, too, bro. He said, you don't shove it down my throat. He says, you make it so it's enjoyable. I want, I want to hear what you got to say, and I want what you, what you got. I said, you can get it. He said, I'm thinking. But it's so cool because actually in the last three weeks, about 15 people recommitted or accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Even one Friday. It's amazing. What will happen if you learn that this is a warfare and learn the strategies and go forward and watch what God is doing in our midst. So now, watch this. I love it. God Teach my hands to war so that the bull of steel is broken by mine arms. What I'm speaking of is something extraordinary. Remember, God left the giants in the land to produce struggle so that you can learn how to fight. So watch, watch this down. He's speaking of ordinary people doing the extraordinary. When you think about David and Goliath, David was about five foot tall. They exhumed his body. He was only like five foot tall, maybe five one. Can you imagine a five foot one man up against a nine, ten, eleven foot giant? And as that giant's taunting him, he says, I don't come to you in my name. I don't come to you in my power. I don't come to you in my strength. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, who you have been, God of the armies of who you have to fight. You're not, look, you're an uncircumcised Philistine. I'm of the covenant. And I stand because I'm in the covenant. 
So the ordinary did the extraordinary. Why? We're dependent on God. Watch this. He says, he teaches my hands to war. Guidance. He teaches. Strategy. He teaches me strategy to war. He teaches me purpose. A bow of steel is broken. He teaches me strength because they're broken by my arms. Amen? It's some very, very powerful stuff. Amen? So, 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 number one, we're at war. He knew we needed to learn how to fight, so he left giants in our lives. And let me tell you this, not everybody's giant is the same. Number two, giants distinguish the difference between professors and possessors. I hear a whole lot of people tell them what they're going to do. I hear a whole lot of people tell me how they're going to do it, and then when it comes time to do it, talking the talk but not walking the walk. You see, it's one thing to confess the promises of God. It's another thing to strap on your sword and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with that giant in your life and possess your promises. So the giants God leaves in the church. The giants God leaves in the community. It gives us a chance to know who's serious and who's not. It gives us a chance to say who's just talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. Number three, giants expose the grasshoppers in the crowd. You know, I, I see the crowd of the three stooges. And when they say somebody needs to lead, Mo always gets in the back. And when he's in the back, he says, so why are you back there? He says, because when we turn around and run, I'll be leading. You can always tell when the giants come out, first off, the, 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 the grasshoppers are going to speak up. If you look at the Red Sea, the grasshopper spoke up. We told you we should have went back. We told you it weren't going to work. We told you. Just let us go back and eat out of the flesh pots of Egypt. But we listen to you, Moses, and look at the mess we're in. There's the grasshopper speaking up. And Mara, they just saw the Red Sea open and they've gone on the other side. Now they're at Mara. And, and, and they can't get good water to drink. And here it goes again. Moses, we told you, you shut up. Left us alone. We started believing and started trying to possess the promises of God. And here it is. The grasshopper started speaking early. We just read in the text. The ten spies were, were the lead grasshoppers. Everything God said is true, but we realize we got to fight to get it. No, we realize we got to fight to get it. The giants are humongous. We thought God was just going to hand it to us. No, he's not going to hand it to you. He wants you to be willing So when the grasshoppers, when the giants show up, the grasshoppers start hopping away. As a matter of fact, the grasshoppers blend into the environment to praise God. The giants uncover them. The ten spies never made it to the promised land. They died of a plague. All the guys that believed them from 20 years and up, they all died. It was a, that was a 40-year funeral. I forget how many million funerals it would have been a day. The people, the people, uh, uh, well, not millions, but how many hundreds of funerals a day as they marched through the wilderness, walking, it was an 11 day trip, 11 days. But because they let the grasshoppers get control, it became a 40 year death march. Wow. Y'all say wow. Yeah, I, I thought so too. Now, watch this. I'm mean, almost through. Y'all say, really? Yeah. Yeah, really. Really. <laughs> Don't you remember something? Grasshoppers.
promised land faith with a grasshopper mentality. I had to go real slow because I want you to look at it. Y'all say that grasshoppers don't eat grapes. Amen? So now, you're ready, you're ready. here we go. We're getting close to the end now. The last two things and then we're going to go, go home. Ready? Number four. When giants come in your life, you get to know your real self. Remember me telling you, Daniel told me, I said, I tell, I tell Daniel, so you got some new people tonight. He goes, I know and I hate it. I said, why? I said, because we get in trouble. They don't know what to do. And then we went to Afghanistan. They said, Daddy, I don't like the new guys with me. I like them, but I don't like them with me. He said, because you get in trouble. They don't know what to do. They, 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 they just kind of shrink down and go away. And then, then he told me this little story. He said, Daddy, he said, we carry a lot of chiefs of staff. And I guard the chiefs of staff, and I guard these generals. And he said, uh, <clears throat> when they get in the car, there's a driver. I'm, his, I'm the guy in charge. I'm protecting everybody. And he says, I got my, my AK-47. He said, look back at the general. I say, sir, I need you. If we come up with fire, to lay down. He said, and if I'm taken out, he said, I'm going to fight for you. He said, if I'm taken out, I need you to push this button. He said he did it to the Navy, to an Admiral, he did that to the to an army, to a general, he did it to the Air Force. And every that's home said, Yes, sir, you got it. We're gonna lay it down. He said he got a Marine Corps guy. General. He started at the very bottom. Sniper. Worked his way up his general. Daniel said, Sir, if we come under fire, I need you to duck. And I'll protect you. He said, duck. He pulled out his gun. He said, I'm going to get me some too. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you duck. I'm going to take care of this. Get to learn yourself when you're in a struggle. Tea bags. You can never tell the true strength of a tea bag until it gets in hot water. Tea kettles. Do their greatest singing when they're up to their neck in hot water. So what? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Number five, the last one. This I was through. I said this last one. Don't get your hopes up. No, <laughs> it's King Clark. Not only do you get to know yourself, you really get to know your God. I sit back and I think about the things that we've been through in our lives and, and the tragic loss of my mother, the tragic loss of D.C.'s mother, and the tragic loss of Bethany. And I think about those losses and, and, and I think about all this stuff. I think about it all the time. And, and used to, years ago, I'd say, God, can you show me why? Can you help me understand this? But as time has gone by and as I've gotten older in the Lord, and as I have gotten, I, I, I've, I've grown to trust him more. I found out, number one, I found out more about me going through all this. Because I handled it different all three times. There were different relationships, of course, but still, if you look at any psychological manual, the, the top three things that bring stress in your life, and the top three grief problems is going to be your parents, your spouse, your children. So I got all three of them. And they were all three handled differently. And I, I thought about it. And I said, you know what, God? Now I understand. When all this was going down, you gave me a chance to see the real me. And I got a chance to work on the real me. But also, I saw you, God, in a whole different light. I didn't no longer see you as just some big God up in heaven waiting for me to push the vending machine to get my spiritual blessing. I saw you when you said you wouldn't conform us to the glory of your son who carried that cross of that hill to 
have that same kind of thought. One night, Bethany was not doing so great. It was on a Thursday night. And I said, Bethany, I don't know whether I need to go to PCDC and I or not. She said, Dad, you better go. I said, yeah, but you're not doing the best in the world. She said, I'll be all right. Got it. I said, I'm still not sure. She said, Dad, and she loved to say this, don't let me down. I said, okay, Bethany. I remember going. And when I got there, I was over in the juvies, juveniles. And there was about 20 juveniles. And some of those guys were trying to be big and bad, trying to show everybody how bad they were. And they were cussing me, and we were trying to, trying to, I was trying to read the Bible, and as I was reading the Bible, they were cussing in between the Bible, and it was just, it was just terrible. I saw some guys disgust, I saw other guys, you know, edging them on. And I stopped, and I'm going to tell you one reason, that one thing that helped me was all this stuff I'd been through. I stopped and said, hold, fellas, stop right now, stop, stop, just stop. And I said, and they were, they were locked up, so only two people, because there were two in the cell, so they could see each other, but that was it, they couldn't see all the other guys. And I said, how long has it been since a real man told you he believed in you? And all of a sudden, all that stuff changed. All that murmuring, all that mouth, it all changed. And I, I watched them because they were, they were at the windows and their heads just hung down. I saw them ask it again. How long has it been since a real man says he believed in you? And I said, I got a daughter over at the cancer center. She's in bad shape. She told me not to let y'all down tonight, Sonny. So I left her to be with you. So I want you to know that I believe in you. Everybody was real quiet. You could hear a pin drop. And then I said, how long has it been since a real man told you that he loved you? And I said, I'm not talking about an old mammy pammy kind of love where you're touchy-feely. I'm talking about the kind of love that you're willing to take a cross and put it on a beaten back and carry it up a hill for somebody else. That kind of love. How long has it been? I looked and the guys were all of them. Every last one of them. They were sobbing. Some of them you could even hear them sobbing. I said, I want you to know I love you and I believe in you. I forget how. I think all of them. All of them recommitted to the Lord that night. And when I left, there was no more cussing. There was no more game calling. But they were thanking me for coming. And I thought, you know, Lord, I wouldn't even have thought about it eight years ago. But after going through all the things, all the giants in my life, that helped me to see this in a whole different light. And as I was walking out, I started thanking God for the giants in my life. Thank you, God. Because now I see myself different and I see you different. And now those guys see you different. The next time I come in there, the guys that have been cussing me apologize to me. Ask me to forgive them. I've never had the prisoners apologize and ask me to forgive them. These guys are asking me to forgive them. And they said, we'll never do it again. I said, it's okay. I'm a big man. I can handle it. They said, no, we were wrong. But you see, in all the struggles, you get to know yourself like you've never known yourself before. You get to know your God like you've never known him before. You see, DC, get ready, buddy. Now, now I'm getting close to the end. Do you 
He replaced him. Decision time. Every last person in here, it's your decision time. Are you going to be a grasshopper and have the promises of God around you and can't put your hand on them because you're complaining? Because you got your mind consumed in the giants? God knows this. There, am I going to stand? Watch this. You stand and fight with God through the struggles. If you'll stand and fight with God through the struggles, you will eventually eat the grace. Don't I mean you eat them today. You might eat them tomorrow. But if you'll stand and fight with God, eventually you'll eat the grapes, the promises of God.
them. I may never even see them. Everybody stand. Just 
remember God did not leave the giants in your life to destroy you. He left the giants in your life so that you would lean on Him. And that you could grow through Him. When I see the giants in my life, I know I can't handle it. I know I'm not strong enough. I'm not wise enough. I'm not powerful enough. I'm not smart enough. I need God. These giants hurt. They're playing for keeps. They're striking at my heart. They're striking at my, my throat. I need God. We're all going to pray right now. When everybody put your hands up, everybody put your hands up. Repeat after me. God, these giants are terrible. Sometimes I feel they're going to take me down. Help me to trust you more. Help me to lean on you. Help me, Lord, not to lean on my own understanding. Help me, Lord, to draw strength from you even now. Help me, Lord, right now to know you got this. And I trust you, God. And I'm going to give it to you. And help me stand and fight so I can eventually eat the grace. And I thank you for it right now. In the name of Jesus, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And have all of you still open. If anybody has a need from God, you're welcome to come. Just come on up. If you need something from God that we prayed for, you got something I need in your life, you're more than welcome to come up here. God's got this. God's got this. Tuesday night, there you go. Tuesday nights, come on out here. If you like to have fun and also talk about God where the rubber meets the road. Tuesday nights. Amen. We get some we get some pretty wild discussions at times. Amen. God's got this. Look at somebody get to him. God's got it. God's got this. Amen. But, you know, we're gonna do something different today. We're gonna say the Lord's Prayer. Is our dismissal. Ready? You know, it's kind of, it, it's so wild because when I go into B5, which is where the, the heroin addicts are, we always do the Lord's Prayer. And we do it here on Tuesday nights, and every morning, Lynn and I do it. Say the Lord's Prayer. And remember I told you that it's, it's written, it's recorded 
in Jewish history that the apostles said the Lord's Prayer minimum three times a day. That's how powerful that prayer is. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he told them, and so three times a day, they would, they would say the Lord's Prayer. That's how powerful and how awesome that prayer is. It just amazes me, though, because we say it in one way. The same words, but the breaks. You know, we break here, break there. The, the, the heroin addicts were so excited, I can't get them to slow down long enough. You remember, we know how you... Our Father was already in heaven, how's me that day? Woo, okay. All right, uh, <laughs> but, but it's still cool, because you know what? No matter how you say it, it's still got power. It's still got authority. It still handles the situation. So let's say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And Lord, I ask you right now, Lord, let your peace go out with these folks. Help them to feel it and know that you've got this and that your hands upon them and that nothing they face today, nothing 